in the world today there's a hurting multitude who has yet to hear that Jesus died for them that Christ is buried but he rose again now he lives forevermore to redeem the world and save us from our sin there is hope for the hopeless in the Savior there is help for the helpless in the Lord so let us take the gospel story to each and every one Jesus came to die for all the world for the rich man in the palace for the beggar on the street Jesus shed his blood for all sins powers to defeat he conquered death hell and the grave now he gives us victory and he offers his salvation to everyone who will believe will you believe there is hope for the hopeless in the savior there is hell for the helpless in the lord so let us take the gospel story to each and every one jesus came to die for all the world so let us take the gospel story to each and every one jesus came to die for all the world jesus came to die for all the world My soul in sad exile was out on life's sea, so burdened with sin and distress, till I heard a sweet voice saying, make me your choice, and I entered the haven of rest. I anchor my soul in the haven of rest I'll sail the white seas no more The tempest may sweep or the wild stormy deep In Jesus I'm safe evermore I yield in my soul in this tender embrace and faith taking hold of the word. My fetters fell off and I anchored my soul. The haven of rest is my Lord. The song of my soul since the Lord made me whole has been the old story so blessed of jesus who will save whosoever will have a home in the haven of rest i've anchored my soul in the haven of rest i'll sail the white seas no more the tempest may sweep or the wild stormy deep in jesus i'm safe evermore oh come to the savior he patiently waits to save by his power divine come anchor your soul in the haven of rest and say my beloved is mine i've anchored my soul in the haven of rest i'll sail the white seas no more the tempest may sweep or the wild stormy deep in jesus i'm safe evermore 
In Jesus I'm safe evermore. Amen. Well, thank you. That was a great blessing. Well, you guys, that, that's, I just enjoyed it from walking in the back door and hearing you. That, that really has been a great blessing. Take your Bibles and turn to 1 Samuel chapter 12. It is a privilege for me to be here on several different levels. And um, I appreciate your pastor. He, as he says, he's been a, I've been a friend to him. He's certainly been a friend to me. I appreciate him. I appreciate his wife. They've been very faithful here. I look, at, I look at the Bowmans kind of like, if you read scripture, you look at Joshua, and you see the faithfulness of the assistant, and then you see how God rewards that. And then I appreciate the Kilpatricks and their faithfulness to see now what God's doing, and one of our young men was able to work with them over the past summer. And I want to tell you, Brother Steve, that's probably the most growth I've seen in him, and I know it's from your example that I've seen his entire life, and I appreciate that. I thank you for investing in him, and that's a great blessing to me, very much so. To the woman who came, who heard me on the radio, I can only apologize. That's it. <laughs> now you know why we have a radio ministry and not a television ministry. That's, you just catch that real. But I will say this. Where's Brother Joe? Brother Joe Mears, where are you? Brother Joe Mears came up to me during the handshake time, and he pointed out uh, Mike Davis, the sound guy. And that's his name, right, Mike Davis? And he said, you know, I was, when I saw you two, he goes, I just realized how much you two look alike. That's exactly what he said to me. Now, I don't care if this sounds awkward or not, but I think Mike Davis is a right good-looking man. That's just, <laughs> that's all I'm going to say about it. Thank you guys for inviting me. This to be the, the first revival under your pastorate. What a great honor that is for me to be a part of this. I want to say thank you to the Traxlers. I was not able to be here this to this morning, I actually had a youth rally up in Ripley, West Virginia last night. We had several young people saved, and um, aisles full of young people surrendering their life to Christ. And so I was not able to get back uh, for this morning, but I do want to say thank you to the Traxlers. It's a great privilege for me to have someone like uh, he and Miss Betty in my church. It really is. He did our deacon's retreat for us. And when I was talking to your pastor, he was even telling me about the sermons that he preached about Jacob, about Paul and Silas. And so for me, it's a privilege to have someone like that associated uh, with Somerville Baptist Church. And so I want to say thank you to the Traxlers very much. And this has been quite a day. You guys sound good, but I got to tell you, there's, there's some that are disappointed. I'm just going to be straight up with you. While we were coming down here, my son Christian's with me. He's sitting there in the back. And when uh, we were headed down... Uh, he heard Brother Bowman on the phone, the speakerphone, talking about that a Crown College group was here. And so we hung up, <clears throat> and we had a Crown College group with us several months ago. And he goes, wow. He goes, you think it's going to be that girls group that came before? <laughs> and I just let that ride, you know. I wanted him to hear how that sounded. And I just looked over at him and he goes, no, 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 the music, how good they sang. That's, Sure. So you guys sound good, but you're not much to look at. I just got to put it to you. That's <laughs> First Samuel chapter 12. Take your Bibles, please, and turn there. First Samuel chapter 12. We are a bearded clan here now, aren't we? Man, everybody's wearing a beard. Well, the reason we're doing that, I got to tell you, I, I noticed that in the lights. Man, it, it is, it's a hot box up here. You know, as Curtis Hudson said, all the greatest men always come out on top. And so what's happening is we're losing our hair on top, so we're trying to make up for it in the other parts. But I have a good reason. I don't know your pastor's reason. I have a very good reason. And all the uh, ladies in here appreciate it. I went to the Philippines several weeks ago, and uh, I appreciate the church taking on the Filipino National Pastors Project. God is blessed in a great way. Our pastors were safe through the typhoons that came through over the past few days. Thank you for praying. Um, but when I went over there, I just didn't shave. I just got lazy and I didn't shave. So when I came back, I remember the Sunday morning when I was getting ready to go to the church and I'm standing in front of the mirror admiring myself and as I'm getting ready to shave, I pick up the razor, I'm getting ready to take it off and my wife walks into the restroom behind me, the bathroom. She's looking in the mirror at me and she says, hmm, that looks good. You know how rarely we get that at my age in life? 
So I just took the razor and I calmly set it down and I walked away. So I'm not going liberal. It's just I love that my wife loves me. And so that's why I'm, that's why I'm wearing it. First Samuel chapter 12. We'll begin with verse 1. I will not keep you long. You've been here for quite some time today. But I do want us to go into the Word and really kind of maybe, maybe put just a capstone to all that we've gone through this, this day. And Samuel said unto all Israel, now let's give the setting here. Samuel is at the very end of his ministry. He is coming to the end of the age of the judges. This was a time of transition. He was a very good judge, the scripture says. It's very clear about this, that he was a good judge. But the people now were wanting a king of their own. They had expressed it. Now, there's a personal reason to Samuel as to why that's true, and we'll address that in a moment. But there's also a national reason that they want to be like the kingdoms around them. And the Lord said, what you love about Samuel is that Samuel disagreed with the nation strongly, but he submitted to the Lord. He disagreed with the nation, but he agreed in submission with the Lord. The Lord said, I'm going to give them what they want, but they're not going to want what they get. And sure enough, we know that to be true. So Samuel is going through a natural process now. He's coming to the end of his earthly ministry. And as he's coming to the end of his earthly ministry, he's standing in front of these thousands upon thousands upon thousands of his Israelites, and he's wanting to hear from them a testimony of his judgeship, of his ministry. And so this is the setting now, as he stands in front of all them. Saul is already king now. Saul's somewhere right here around the edges, up front of the stage. And so it's a courtroom scene that's basically taking place here. Beginning with verse 1, And Samuel said unto all Israel, Behold, I have hearkened unto your voice, and all that you said unto me, and have made a king over you. And now behold, the king walketh before you, and I am old and gray-headed. And behold, my sons are with you, and I've walked before you from my childhood unto this day. Behold, here I am. Witness against me before the Lord and before his anointed. Whose ox have I taken, or whose ass have I taken, or whom have I defrauded, or whom have I oppressed, or of whose hand have I received any bribe to blind mine eyes therewith, and I will restore it you. And they said, Thou hast not defrauded us, nor oppressed us, neither hast thou taken aught of any man's hand. And he said unto them, The Lord is witness against you, and his anointed is witness this day that he have not found aught in my hand, and they answered, He, the Lord, is witness. Several years ago this past week, we had our former youth pastor come back. He went up and took a church replant up in Vermont, and we brought him back in. We do a missions month. We used to do missions conference. Now we go through the entire month because we want people that only come on Sunday mornings to hear about faith promise more than one time. And we brought back Steve Chevron, his wife, now they have two children, but Ellie was their first. And I can remember when Ellie was born. She was born in uh, Decatur Hospital. I remember after the birth, and it was quite a, it was a traumatic birth. Uh, the the uh, health of Whitney was kind of in jeopardy, the mom. And I can remember we finally got through all that. We're standing outside the still grated window there, looking into the nursery at Ellie. And it's myself, and it's Steve, and then it's the grandfather, Daryl Brown, standing on the other side very first grandchild until Dawson just came their only grandchild and I can remember saying to Daryl quietly as they rolled Ellie into the nursery I said Don, you know Daryl there is your legacy silence and then he said you know pastor the fact is when we pass away all that will be left of us is a memory. Then I was silent. Wow. I remember going back to the car and that constantly staying with me. You know, when it's really all said and done, all that's going to be left of us is a memory. The issue with that one is that logic answers that is the kind of begging the question statement. And the begging the question statement is this. It's the obvious question. What will I be remembered for? And all the way back from Decatur out, out to Somerville, that, that thought, I can remember stopping on the, on the side. I, I, there was a cemetery that's off the interstate there, and that's typically where you find a quiet place. If it gets loud there, something's gone bad wrong, or really right. But 
for a moment. And so I stopped into the cemetery, and I, and I sat there, and I just thought over that question over and over and over. What am I going to be remembered for? By my children, by my wife, by my church, by my friends. What will I be remembered for? What is going to be my legacy? That is exactly what Samuel is wanting to know. What is my legacy? What am I leaving behind? I think that's a question that we should all ask. If we're in here and we're more mature years, then I want to encourage you to finish this well. The older that I get, the more, Brother Traxler, the more that I am, I've come to the place. Brother Kilpatrick, I admire both these men in a great way. You know, I get tired of the gifted a lot of times. The talented ones, particularly. We put so much spotlight on those. And the older I've gotten, the less impressed I am with giftedness. Even less so with potential, because potential is something that's unrealized. What I'm impressed with as I grow older, and you should in wisdom know this already, is what God's impressed with. He's impressed with faithfulness. See, faithfulness is something that's available to every believer by way of his grace, he gives his gifts out severally, but the opportunity for faithfulness is given to every believer in Jesus Christ. So what he's looking for, he's not looking for the same level of talent, he's not looking for the same level of income or outgo as we measure outgo, but he is looking for the same level of faithfulness, whether you have one or five or ten talents. The issue at the end of the life of the stewards was not that the person um, um, made money off of it. It's the fact that he buried it, that he wasn't willing to take a godly risk with it, that he wasn't willing to stay faithful in what God had given him. So this morning, here's my question. It's this afternoon. What will you be remembered for? Young people, let me tell you something. Throughout Scripture, you're going to find this phrase popping up. And it's going to be this phrase when it comes to young men, young ladies, and he prepared his heart to seek the Lord. You'll find that with Daniel. You'll find that with Hezekiah. He prepared his heart to seek the Lord. You know what he's thinking? At it? Almost every single young person that's ever gone into ministry, that's ever been used by God in a great way, if you trace back their thought process, there was a part of logic. Yes, it was the call of God, but there was also a logic to it. And the logic was this. At the end of this life... What am I going to leave behind? What will I have accomplished if I have a great job, if I make a lot of money, if I have a lot of power, or maybe I'm known famously for something? But, but all that, how will that matter at the end of this life? It's really coming down to something deductive, and it's this idea of, of really deducing your life, just boiling it down to this idea, you know, the only thing that really matters is serving Jesus Christ. There's nothing else that really counts past this life. Everything else, as Solomon said, is vanity. It's all vanity. The younger we realize that, the more that God can use us in a God-sized way. So Samuel, he's asking the question here. And he's asking the question first. I want you to notice in verses 1 and 2, a certain end is taking place. He says in verse 1, And Samuel said unto all Israel, Behold, I have hearkened unto your voice and all that you said to me, and have made a king over you. This had to break Samuel's heart. It really did. And now behold the king, it's Saul, he's standing head and shoulders above the rest, you don't have to look for him, and Saul walketh before you, but then I want you to notice the next phrase, but I am old and gray-headed. He's now contrasting himself, and you can see almost this realization that here it is. You know, I knew it was coming. Whenever you come to the end of something, it's one of those times that you say, you know, I knew it was coming, I just didn't think it would be today. Or I knew it was coming, I just didn't think it would be this way. Well, he's come to that time now. I am old and gray-headed, and behold, my sons are with you, and I have walked, watch this, and I have walked before you from my childhood unto this day. You know, he's saying here that there is a certain end. You have to begin with the end in mind. Guys, I'm telling you right now, you can serve God for 20 years. You can serve God for 25, 30 years. But I gotta tell you, you'll be remembered for the last years of faithfulness. The last decisions you make will be those that you're remembered for. Whether that's good or whether that's bad, there have been men that have served God in great ways, but they were always remembered for the last decisions that they made. You begin with the end in mind. 
And the end is this. I am going to be faithful to Jesus Christ until the day he calls me home by way of death or by way of rapture. I am going to leave a legacy of faithfulness. I'm determined that that's going to be my legacy. You do that now. Well, pastor, I'm going through a difficult time. I understand. I really do. But I will tell you this. David even said it this way. Some of us older ones in here, well, I've been forgotten. I've been, boy, nobody even realizes all the times that I've served. And I do understand that. And I think it's important for us to uphold the, the more mature members of our congregation because they are why we're here in a lot of ways. But realize that the psalmist felt the same way. And you know what his attitude was? His attitude was, I was once young, but now I'm old. And I've never seen the righteous forsaken. Well, let it also be said, we've never seen the righteous forsaken, and let it be said of our life that we will never allow our Lord to see us forsake him. It's a certain end. The time's coming. Prepare for that now. Live your life in view of that now. Well, how do we do this? Fred Craddock made a great statement. He was addressing a group of ministers years ago, and he talked about these practical implications of beginning with the end of mind. He said, I quote, to give my life for Christ, it appears glorious. To pour myself out for others, to pay the ultimate price of martyrdom, and I'll do it. I'm ready, Lord, to go out in a blaze of glory. We think giving our all to the Lord is taking a $1,000 bill and laying it on a table, he said. Here's my life, Lord, I'm giving it all to you. But he, he said the reality of it for most of us is that he sends us to the bank and he has this cash in, the $1,000 bill, for stacks of quarters. We go through life putting out 25 cents here and 50 cents here, listening to the neighbor kid's troubles instead of saying, <clears throat> get lost. Go to a committee meeting. Give a cup of water to a shaky old man in a nursing, ho nursing home. He said, usually giving our life to Christ isn't glorious. It's done in all those little acts of love, 25 cents at a time. Then he finishes and he says it this way. It would be easy to go out in a flash of glory. It's harder to live the Christian life little by little over the long haul. Begin with the end of mind, and it's the small little decisions. It's the little ways that we give. It's the little ways that we live. It's the little ways that we're faithful that account for much in the economy of God. You see first the certain end. Secondly, you see in Scripture the courtroom scene. Now look at verse 3 of what happens. It's this courtroom scene. You have the judge you have the jury, you have the defendant now that's standing before them in verse 3. He says, behold, here I am. Here comes the legal language. Witness against me before the Lord and before his anointed. Whose ox have I taken or whose ass have I taken or whom have I defrauded or whom have I oppressed or of whose hand have I received any bribe to blind mine eyes therewith and I will restore it. You know, there's a reason why he's using this language. Out of all the things that you're going to say, <clears throat> why are you going to say, you know, who have I cheated? Where is my integrity in question? Well, why is this all financial that's coming up? Well, there's a reason for that. And you, you don't need to turn there now, but if you go back to chapter 8 and verse 15, you're going to find that the people come to Samuel. And one of the reasons that they asked for a king has something to do with Samuel's legacy. Because when they come, they say, Samuel, you've lived for the, for the Lord your whole life, but your sons are not following in your ways. Your sons are taking bribes. Your sons are getting paid off. They, they basically were taking money under the table. That's why now he's coming and he's wanting to know, look, I want you to be very clear about this. I, I want you to be very serious about this. I, my name, my legacy is not besmirched by the decisions my sons have made. Now, his two sons went into ministry. They were up in Beersheba. But they had ruined their ministry by a lack of integrity in financial matters. Now Samuel's asking this question. Witness to me. I want you to, I want you to tell me. I need to hear this before I go and see the Lord. And then in verse 4, and they said, Thou hast not defrauded us, nor oppressed us, neither hast thou taken aught of any man's hand. And he said unto them, The Lord is witness against you and is anointed as witness this day, that ye have not found aught in my hand. And they answered, He is witness. One thing that I love about the South is that our name still means something. I would encourage you, those of us who are younger in here, those of us who are older in here, I encourage, don't lose that part of our cultural tradition. Um, my dad, my grandfather was a pastor in Tuscaloosa for years. My dad, he's carried on that 
torch. Now it's passed on to me. And I'm not saying that all our children are called into pastoral ministry, but that wasn't the great gift that my father has given me or that his dad gave him. The great gift was riches. I mean, tremendous riches. I mean, serious riches. Because the scripture says that a good name is rather to be chosen than great riches. And so the name Lewis has been passed on to me. And in this part of the country, that means something. And I treasure that and I guard that. And, and I tell my children, when they Whenever they go somewhere, whenever they're headed off to camp or headed off to college, they always know that there's two things. I say, guys, remember the two things. And they can say it back to me now. Every once in a while, if I'm not watching close, they'll roll their eyes. They won't do it when I'm watching. But they'll roll their eyes. And the two things are this. Remember who you are. Remember what your family name is. Remember that it's been guarded through the generations. Don't let that go down this generation. Now, some of us in here are saying, well, Pastor Lewis, I'll be honest with you. My, my family name isn't like yours. <clears throat> my family name isn't something that's been passed down as godly through the generations. Then start the legacy. This is your opportunity. I'm talking about my grandfather now. May your grandchildren be talking about you in the years to come, that you pass to them great riches of a good name. But if you have been passed down a good name, then cherish that. Hold on to that. Guard that. But there's a second thing that I say to them. It's not only remember who you are, but remember whose you are. Your pastor mentioned we've been bought with a price. We're not our own. Remember that every action that we do, remember every place we go, every thought that we think, every word that we say does not only reflect on us or our family, but it also reflects on our Savior. You see... The courtroom scene, you see the certain end. And then third and finally, this afternoon, you see the kingly witness. There's something interesting that shows up here. In verse 2, it says, and now behold, there's this party that's just kind of hanging around. It says, and now behold, the king walketh before you. You see it again down in verse 3. It says, and behold, here I am, witness against me before the Lord and before his anointed. Down in verse 5. The Lord is witness against you, and his anointed is witness this day. So over and over you find this anointed being, being part of this. This unspeaking witness being a part of this. I know I'm stretching this contextually, but I do still think that it fits an application. Let me say this to you. For all those who are looking at our family name, for all those who may be seeing us from a human testimony side, for all those that are marking our words and seeing our actions, for everything that we do, there is an unseen witness that is watching us. Our king is watching. Now immediately we say, oh, I get it, Pastor, I'm with you. I know what you're going. I know where you're going here, Brother Shane. You're going, to, that means the things that we do, the bad things, we've got to be careful because God's watching. The other day we were in the hospital. I was making a visit of a family that had a baby, and there was a plaque. And on the plaque it said, uh, quote, I saw that, dot, 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 God. And that's what they were selling. In other words, God's watching what you're doing. You're not getting by with this. This is often how we view the, the omnipresence of God. But that in Scripture, it, it says that a couple of times, but the eyes of the Lord are not just beholding the evil. They're also beholding the good. He, he's watching those who are paying the price for him. And that's the reason. Look, and the beauty of this, the beauty of this is true because our king, has, he's living through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Our, our, our king is resurrected. And the whole point of the resurrection in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he goes all the way through this saying, if the resurrection is not true, then we're all men of all men most miserable. But he is risen, it says in verse 20. And he goes all the way through this great apologetic on the resurrection till he gets to the very end. In the very end, the point that he's making is this. Wherefore? Because your king is risen. Because the anointed is watching. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord, that our King is watching. You know, Pastor, when you pass away, all that's going to be left of you is a memory. That is true. So there is a certain end that's going to take place. And in the courtroom scene of our life, what will those who are left behind us say? You're determining that right now. Husband, you're determining that right now, what your wife will say. Well, she may not say it to your face, and she may not even say it about you to others, but you're leaving a legacy behind. Are you leaving a legacy of loving her? The scriptural mandate of loving her. 
of knowing her, of your prayers not being hindered in your relationship with her. Wives, is there a legacy of submission? Is there a legacy of honor, of reverence, of you, of you being talked of in the gates of the city? Hmm. Children, what are they going to say about you? The grandchildren, what's your legacy going to be? You need to ask that now. Now's the time to settle that once and for all. I am going to start today. I'm going to begin with the end in mind. True story. Mary, Queen of Scots, had no children of her own. Mary, Queen of Scots, the reason she was known as Mary, Queen of Scots, is because she was originally from Scotland. And it was common for her to try to get away. She was not comfortable with, with, England, or with London. She hated the city. And so many times she would get out of the city and she would go back up to the lowlands. She didn't go all the way up to the highlands, but she grew up in the lowlands of Scotland. And she would often make the visits. And, and Mary, she loved children. And she loved children so much that she was kind of known as a Pied Piper. So when she would go up to her village that she grew up in, the children would all gather around her and they would walk out through the hillsides. And a lot of times she wouldn't even come back until dark. She would lose track of time. One particular day, she got out so far that a rainstorm had come up over the channel. And as it was coming in, she realized that there was no way for her to get back to the village to shelter before the rainstorm came. And all these children were with her. And so she walked up to this closest hut there on the hillside, and she knocked on the door. And when she knocked on the door, the woman came to the door. And when she came to the door, she was in a hurry, and she was wiping her hands on the apron, and she was kind of huffing and puffing. And she answered the door, opened it, looked at this person, and said, may I help you? And she was very impatient. She did not realize who she was talking to. She did not realize she was addressing her queen. Well, Mary realized she didn't know who she was, so she just simply asked. She didn't want to put her on the spot, so she just asked the question, Ma'am, I am so sorry, but I have gotten out here into the countryside, and I've walked, and I cannot get back to the village before the rain comes, and could you please allow me to borrow your umbrella, and I will be certain to bring it back tomorrow. <sighs> My umbrella. Yes. Would you, would you please be so gracious? The woman turned back around. She walked into her little hut, and she looked there beside the fireplace. And beside the fireplace, there was not just one umbrella. There were two umbrellas. The reason there were two umbrellas is because the one umbrella that was sitting there was torn. It had two tears in the umbrella itself. One of the spines were broken on the umbrella, so it wouldn't even extend completely out properly. There was no way that that was going to shelter. So in turn, she had just recently gone out and bought a brand new one, a very nice one, a very sacrificial price she paid for that with her budget. So she starts thinking about it, looking at the two umbrellas, and she goes, you know that woman standing at the door will never know the difference. So she grabbed the old tattered umbrella. She walked to the door and she goes, I'm so sorry. And she feigned, you know, being apologetic. She goes, I'm so sorry. Here's this umbrella and it's torn and it's broken. But this is, this is all I have. This is the very best that I have. But please take this. The queen looked at it. I understand. It's almost as if she knew. The queen, Mary, queen of Scots, the queen of England, turned around. She opened this umbrella. One of the sides flopped down. There were two tears in it. Water was just pouring in. And the queen of England is walking back with this tattered mess of an umbrella back to the village getting soaking wet. The next day, about the same time, there was a knock at the door. This time, the woman comes to the door of her hut. She opens it up, and as soon as she opens it up, she's looking at six soldiers. It wasn't just six regular soldiers. This was the queen's guard. The spokesman steps up and he goes, Ma'am, are you the one who lent an umbrella yesterday? Well, well, yes, sir, I am. And he pulls the umbrella from behind him and he says, Here is your umbrella. This pathetic little tattered mess. And he goes, And by the way, your queen, Queen Mary, she thanks you for your generosity. It strikes her who was at her door. The story is told that the king, the queen's guards get back on their steeds and they ride back into the village and they hear her almost all the way back to the village because the woman, as they got on their horses and rode away, collapsed to her knees in the threshold of that little hut with this tattered little mess of an umbrella in her hands crying out these words, 
I did not give my queen my best. I did not give my queen my best. I did not give my queen my best. And over and over it echoed through those lowlands. Scripture says one day that you and I will stand before our king. And may we say without reservation, Lord, we gave you our best. Lord, it wasn't much. Lord, what it was, I gave it to you. And to have the kingly witness say those words that we've been longing to hear our entire life. Child, I agree with you. Well done, my good and faithful servant. May that be our legacy.